Okay, welcome to this episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. My name is Paul Burgess, and I'm here today with. Do you know what? I've known him for years, but he hasn't known that because um, he didn't know me. Um, I'm here with Jonathan Baylor, and I'm really, really pleased to have him on because a lot of his work that I was listening to about 10 years ago has influenced a lot of what I've done. And um, it's so good to catch up with him in person. So, Jonathan, thanks for coming on, mate. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. Mate, um, I'm excited to talk about what we're going to talk about because back in the day, a lot of your message was quite new. And a lot of people were like looking at it and thinking, well, that's not the normal thing that we get. You know, eat less, exercise more. You're kind of saying the opposite. And then you're saying this weird thing about, how much your weight should be and this and this thing called a set point and and it was it was really quite cutting edge at the time so before we talk about that just a brief background about you and and how we came to be here now and then we're going to plow into the whole set point and diet and weight management and everything else very brief background on me is growing up, I was disgusted with my body. And a lot of people I know have had this experience. The interesting pivot for me personally, though, was I was disgusted by how thin I was. I, I was underweight and struggled to gain weight, and it was repulsive to me. So I did all kinds of crazy things in an effort to gain weight. I spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on supplements monthly. And this was back in the day when very dangerous things were still legal. I tried pretty much all of them with the exception of anabolic steroids. I was taking in about 6,000 calories per day in an effort to try to gain. I couldn't. I then became a personal trainer. Uh, While I was a trainer, I had a life-changing experience, which I was sitting across the desk from one of my clients who was this amazing professional female, and I'm like 19 at the time, and she's crying and she says, Jonathan, I'm eating 1,200 calories per day just like you told me. And I'm exercising for an hour a day, just like you told me. And I'm not getting smaller. What's wrong with me? And in that moment, instead of me saying, well, maybe you should just eat 1,000 calories per day, which would have been my standard response, I had a realization, where, which is, you know, I'm a person, she's a person. <laughs> We're both people. I'm eating 6,000 calories per day and can't gain weight. She's eating 1,200 calories per day and can't lose weight. Something isn't adding up here. I quit being a personal trainer. I went on a 15-year research journey to try to answer the question, what makes naturally thin people naturally thin? And can other people make their bodies work more that way? They can. And that's why we're here today. And it is a pretty surprising and unexpected way of doing it. It involves reducing inflammation in your brain, uh, balancing your hormones, and changing the microbiota that live in your gut. And we now know how to do that. And in fact, we've systematized how to do it into a 21-day program. And that's what the new book covers. Perfect. And when, and I remember reading, and I've read the book, and I remember reading that bit at the beginning about the personal training and how basically, and, and I've seen it so many times where people who are thin want to put weight on and it doesn't, do you know what? It doesn't really matter how much they've crammed food into their mouth it's all going to come back off again because it's just not the way their body works. And then you've got, like you say, this other end where they're, they're eating nothing and they still can't lose weight. So in I've got this long list of questions because it was so interesting to me reading your book and, and the points it was making. But tell us what a set point is to start with. So in brief, the set point is the explanation for what you just said. So the reason people, there are some people who can eat 1,200 calories and not gain weight is because they have what's known as an elevated set point. And the reason that I could eat 6,000 calories per day and not lose weight or gain weight was because I have a low set point. And what that means is your set point weight is the range of about 15 pounds that your body is going to fight to keep you at regardless of the quantity of food that you consume. So instead of trying to eat more or less, What we found in the research is changing the quality of what you're eating, not the quantity, is what changes your set point. So that's why, again, this is all eating, exercise, thinking, interacting with the world, sleep. It's a a pivot away from quantity and a pivot towards quality. And going back 10 odd years, when I first came across your work, I think I'm accurate in thinking 
that you were kind of the first person to question calories in, calories out. In in, in other words, that uh, calorie quality is important, not necessarily the amount. And if you're eating whole foods and the nutrient dense, you kind of regulate your own appetite. One of the most shocking things that I found in my research is while I may have been one of the early people in like the popular media to talk about this, there have been what's called isocaloric studies done for, for, for the past 50 years. We have clinical studies showing that if you feed one group of people 2,000 calories of these foods and another group of people 2,000 calories of these foods, that these people will lose significantly more weight than these people, despite the fact that their calorie intake is no different. So the actual experts, scientists, doctors, researchers like Harvard Medical School, Mayo Clinic, Cambridge, Oxford, blah, 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 they have known this and proven this for decades, but it hasn't been told to us until recently. Which is nice of them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's part of the problem. I mean, that's, that's frankly why I have a job and why I have a, a company now, because their job is to do research, not to you know, come on shows like this and talk about it and make it understandable and livable for the average person. So I feel very blessed to have the opportunity to essentially take their work I mean, this is not, none of this is Jonathan's theory. John, this is not, what I think is completely irrelevant because biology is a matter of fact, not a matter of opinion. So I'm taking the facts that these amazing researchers have established. And because I'm an engineer, my one skill is I can turn things into systems that people can work and use and, and enjoy in their lives. So I take their research, I turn it into a simple system that you can use. And, and that's how our company, Sane Solution, as well as this book, The Set Point Diet, came to exist. And so why is it that eating less and exercising more just never works over the long term? Because we see it time and time again, right? People drop a load of weight and then six months later they put it all back on and they can't work it out and they're back on the next diet. There was a very large long-term study done in the United States that showed that eating less and exercising more fails for 95.4% of people who try to do it. And for the remaining 4.6% of people that it works for, the only reason it works is they've learned to tolerate a garbage life where they're hungry and tired the whole time. The reason it always fails is because it's not changing your set point. Trying to eat less and exercise more is a little bit like trying to go to the bathroom less. You can't just try to go to the bathroom less. I mean, you could, I guess, try to go to the bathroom less, just like you could try to sleep less or try to breathe less. And you could probably do it for a little bit. And you could probably make your whole life revolve around it if you wanted to keep it up. But why the hell would you ever want to do that? Don't fight against your body. Heal your body. Work with your body. It's the same thing here. If you have inflammation in your brain, dysregulation in your hormones, and imbalances of the microbiota in your gut, telling that person to just eat less can't work. That's like telling someone who's addicted to heroin, look, just take less heroin. It's, it's not, it doesn't even make sense. We need to heal the underlying cause rather than fighting against it. And the way we do that is by lowering your set point, again, not fighting it. Yeah. So there's three main factors that determine your weight in the book. Tell us what that and that's is. your your brain, your gut, and your hormones. Yeah. And you'll notice I didn't say how much you exercise or how much you count calories. And in a little bit more detail, we now know that if you look at someone who doesn't struggle with their weight, and you look at someone who does struggle with their weight, and we look at their brain, and you put them through an fMRI machine so we can scan their brain, their brains are different in a characteristic and consistent way. And if we measure their levels of hormones in their blood, there are characteristic differences. And if we look at the bacteria living in their gut, there are consistent characteristic differences. Why does that matter? That matters because if we know the differences in brain chemistry, hormonal balance, and gut microbiota between naturally thin people and people who aren't so fortunate, we can develop lifestyle interventions to help people to lower their inflammation of their, in their brain, rebalance their hormones, and heal their gut so that their body works more like the body of a naturally thin person. And... Um the, the the kind of stem of it all, from my perspective, um, is not only the, the poor diet that many people have, but sugar and sh too much of it kind of creates that whole cascade, right? It can ruin your gut biome in a bad way. It can, it can push it towards a bad um, variation of it. 
you uh, it can certainly mess with hormone production and uh, glycation, and then that can certainly mess around with your brain and inflame that. Um, and what's really interesting about your particular view on things and, and the way you uh, promote it in the book is that it's not even anything clever or rocket science. It's literally stop thinking about this crap as food that you're being shoved down the advertising of the TV 24 hours a day and just go back to eating proper food, right? That yeah, it, it, it really is, is that simple. simple. And, and, and that's, that's really, really important to understand, to understand because it, if you understand the model that health can't be complicated, it makes your life really simple because health can't be complicated. I mean, if you, I don't want to offend anybody, but if you think about evolutionary theory, if, if it was really hard for human beings to not die, like if our bodies were stupid and if we had to count calories and if we had to make sure that we exercise this precise amount all the time and take these specific nutritional supplements at these specific times of day, like we would have died off as a species a long freaking time ago because it's really hard to do that, right? So up until the most recent three generations, no one knew what a calorie was. Gyms basically didn't exist. I mean, look up 1950s exercise on the internet. And, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, health can be so enjoyable and so simple. We just need to allow ourselves to experience that. Yeah, but General, I've been preaching the same message for I don't know how long in the fact that this whole thing about way measure, timing, supplement powders and this, that and the other, it just drives people insane mm -hmm. because it, it, it's just not a normal life. But you try getting people off of that and saying to them, look, I don't want you to count any calories anymore. Stop putting things in my fitness pal. Stop measuring and weighing your food. Just eat, right? And eat these foods. When you're hungry, uh, sorry, when you're full, stop. They look at you as though you've got, you've murdered one of their children. Honestly, it's like, I can't do that. If I do that, I'll, I'll become massive and all this. And they're indoctrinated into thinking that's the only way forward. And it's a real shame. I mean, it's great from one perspective, because for people like you and me, there's lots of business there. <laughs> but it's trying to help these people not to stress so much. Paul, you hit the nail on the head when you said it's a shame, because the underlying all of this is the we have been <clears throat> marketed into believing that our bodies are stupid. Like they're just dumb, and if we don't intervene and micromanage them, that will become fat, diabetic, cancer-ridden, heart disease patients. And that's not true. Like there's a part of your brain called your ventromedial hypothalamus, which is specifically there to automatically count calories for you. Like your body is like the most amazing biological miracle that this planet has ever created. And if you can get that, if you can understand that you are of the highest quality, one, you'll just live better, period. Two, you'll also, once you believe that you're high quality and you know you're high quality, you will only put high quality things inside of you because why would you put low quality toxic nonsense inside of a miracle? That doesn't even make any sense. The only thing that um, encourages that is advertising. Because when you go to the hunter-gatherers or the remote places around the world where there's no advertising for that kind of stuff, they're not even aware of it, so they don't even think... It doesn't even come into their conscious. But if you're getting... I don't know what they have in the States anymore. I think they stopped making Twinkies, didn't they? Did they stop making and then I, I think they did, and then they brought them back. It, was, was, it was very sad. sad. I was like, uh -huh. yeah, oh. <laughs> but if you're getting that thrown at you 24 hours a day with the branding and the imaging... Yeah, I'll give you a great example. I lived in Vancouver when I was 19 years old, and I lived there for about six months. I never drank fizzy drinks before I went there. And I was training at Gold's Gym in Vancouver and having a, a lovely time, thank you very much. Within three weeks, I was drinking Diet Coke. Because all you saw were these adverts on TV, bang, 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 and the imaging and everything else that they promote. And I was only there for a short period of time. People that lived there from day one and are there till... The, the last day of their life, they are bombarded with this stuff. So it's ingrained in the culture. And that's why trying to get them to come away from that is so difficult. Because it's, you know, if we had that much advertising for health foods and, you know, 
grass-fed meat and wild fish and things like that, it'd probably be a much easier sell, right? But there's no money in it. That's exactly, exactly right. right. And I, I mean, the one thing that does encourage me, like at least in the United States, when you talk about society's role in this, smoking used to be a real big problem. It's, it's not not a problem anymore, but we do see it trending down. And I don't think people remember just how big of a problem it was. I mean, people, let's remember that we made cars with lighters in them. So like sugar is really, really bad, but until Ford or, or Jaguar starts making cars that have soda dispensers installed in the dashboard, we have not yet reached the level of pervasiveness that smoking had in the early 1900s. But once we communicated and once people understood how bad cigarette smoking was for you, how bad, like I have never met a mother who would intentionally blow secondhand smoke into the face of her child. And once that mother knows that sugar is literally as bad, processed refined sugar is literally as bad for her child, if not worse, and we can talk about that if you want, then blowing secondhand smoke into her child's face, once that information gets out there, I believe we can see the societal change we need to end the diabetes epidemic. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's a long time coming, but it's definitely going the right direction. It's getting sidetracked a little bit with things like, you know, the odd fad that comes along, um, keto, and I'm a fan of keto for the right reasons, if it's used properly, but, you know, everyone jumps on it and says, you know, as long as you do this, this and that, you can eat as much as you like. Mm, there's an issue with that. And now vegans starting to really get some traction, and that's lovely, but there's still some issues with some of that. Um, and, and there'll be another thing that comes along, you know, every five years we get this kind of cycle, don't we, right? But as long as it's trending the right way, and away from processed stuff, then that's great. I had a, somebody tagged me in something yesterday, um, a doctor who was a consultant at a, at a hospital somewhere had put a video on, it was, it was actually LinkedIn, which is weird, so I don't go on LinkedIn. But anyway, someone, someone sent it to me, and this guy was saying, look, if you want to lose weight, you've just got to eat 1,500 calories a day. He's talking about his own BMR was like 2,000. He goes, I'll get up and I'll have a bowl of cereal in the morning with some milk, and then I'll, I'll go to work and I'll have another processed meal at lunchtime. I can't remember what it was. Just the usual crap. And then the evening... No, no, he doesn't have lunch. He goes home and he has, a, he has about 1,000 calories in the evening, and he'll have like a ready meal or something else or something else blah 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 and it was abhorrent you looked at it and go there's a man in authority that people believe telling you all you need to do is eat 1500 calories of anything it doesn't matter what it is and people will believe it because he sits there in a white coat and he's got a doctor in front of his name and that is as bad as in the 60s when the doctors are saying there's no proof that smoking kills you that's exactly right. And that's why I, I mean, my one of my goals with this new book is frankly the conversation about you can eat 1500 calories and lose weight. I mean, whatever. You, if you starve yourself, you can lose weight. I mean, that's no, nobody, you know, no one after World War Two, in a, you know, in war torn Europe where there was famine was morbidly obese. So, yes, starvation can cause weight loss. But our goal isn't weight loss. Everyone's lost weight, but then they just yo yo and gain it all back. Our goal is to lower our set point weight. You cannot lower your set point weight eating 1,500 calories of processed foods. You can temporarily starve yourself and lose weight, but as soon as you stop, you've actually elevated your set point and you will be fatter as a result. Yeah, so let's talk about what the difference between a low set point and a high set point is. The, so the, well, the impact in terms of you as a human, when you have a low set point, when you eat more calories, your body burns more calories. And when you have a high set point, when you eat more calories, your body stores those calories. This is best illustrated by a study that was done at the Mayo Clinic. So this isn't my opinion. This isn't done by some blogger. This was done at the Mayo Clinic where they fed individuals 56,000 calories over eight weeks. And they found that, first of all, nobody gained 16 pounds, which is how much weight they should have gone gained if calorie math was true because they ate 56,000 too many calories. The most anyone gained was a little over eight pounds and some people in the study didn't gain any weight. So how can you eat 56,000 too many calories and not gain weight? Well, they actually studied that and they found that, for example, 
their base metabolic rate automatically increase. The amount of calories they burn digesting food automatically increase. Something called non-activity exercise thermogenesis or NEAT or how much you spontaneously move and just like involuntary muscle fiber twitching. In short, people with a low set point ate 56,000 too many calories over the course of eight weeks and gain nothing because their body says more calories in equals more calories out. Whereas people with a high set point say more calories in, more fat stored. Simple. It's just such an easy message to get across. And then people still want to complicate the matters further. If we want to bring our set point down then, because that's the goal, what's the best strategy for that? The best strategy is to buy my book. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, I'll tell you what, Jonathan, right? So just so sort of people are listening and if they're watching on YouTube, whatever else it is, um, I have no affiliation at all. I don't make any money out of this. Um, I would highly, highly recommend people buy the book. I don't even know how much it is, but I would highly recommend people buy it because as I was reading it, not only did it bring back a lot of um, understanding about things that I learned um, you know, a decade ago, but... There are some very, very simple, at the end of each chapter, there's like a, a conclusion or synopsis of it. And you could just flip back to them for reference every you know, week, month, whatever it is you want to remind yourself of stuff. Quickly look at it and it just tells you exactly what you need to know. So it, it just it's just done well. And there's a lot of stuff in there that didn't need you didn't need to put in, but you put it in because it was relevant, if that makes sense. You could have easily yeah, skipped that. And and, yeah, no. and still got away with a very good book. So yeah, I mean, we, we did. We got in trouble with the publisher because the book was supposed to be eighty thousand words long, and the manuscript came back much longer because we wanted to put everything in there that you needed. Because like, what were? How do you lower your set point? Look, there's food. You got to change what you're eating, but it's not just changing what you're eating. You have to improve your eating habits. You have to change. So, and I don't even want to say improve. You have to increase the quality of your eating habits. You have to look at how you're sleeping. You have to look at your perception of yourself, the way you speak to yourself. You have to look at your relationship with others. You have to look at how you move your body. You have to look at all of these things. And there, because there is no, if you just eat this way and you sleep for four hours a night, you might lose weight, but you're not going to lower your set point. So that's why it's not about weight loss. You can lose weight by cutting off your leg. It's about healing your body and reprogramming your body so that it automatically pursues health rather than being railroaded down a path of disease. So just to answer your question a little bit more specifically, the number one thing that you can do from a dietary perspective to help lower your set point is eat so many non-starchy vegetables and nutritious proteins and whole food fats that you're too full for processed foods. I don't want you to try to avoid processed foods because that's like saying, try not to think of a white bear. Mm. Well, you're going to think of a white bear. <laughs> you want to eat so much of the right food that you're too full for damaging food. And also you find that if you're eating nutrient-dense food, getting all the vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, everything else in that you need, your body kind of doesn't crave anything else. And you don't have... Um, uh, to go and eat sweets or, or chocolates or whatever else it is because your body's not looking for more energy from anywhere. It's got plenty. That's a huge distinction, Paul, that some people don't understand and why we put this into a 21-day program because right now you might say to yourself, like, How, I can't eat. That sounds disgusting. I have cravings. It sounds terrible. Cool. Do this for 21 days. And on day 22, I promise you, because we've proven it, proven it tens of thousands of times, that on day 22, you will not, your brain and taste buds will literally work differently. So you can't, you, you will have a fundamentally different perception of food. You will have a fundamentally different set of cravings. Your cravings will change. Your tastes will change. And you'll be empowered to do this easily for 20 years, not 20 days, but you got to give it your all for like three weeks so that those changes can happen. Yeah. There's, a, there's a great uh, um, example in the book where you talk about red wine. And, mm. you know, when you first drink red wine, it's like, well, well, 
that's not the greatest taste in the world. But you know, a, a little bit of perseverance, and and people will go home after a day at work and open a bottle and finish the thing. So it's it's the same kind of thing. Get your taste buds used to what they're supposed to be having instead of this hyper palatable and you know nutrient poor energy dense crap that people are eating and um, and all of a sudden you're going to crave the vegetables and the proteins and the fats and so on and not have those other issues and and if one, once in a while you want to go out and have something then that's up to you but you, you, people know when they've been eating well for a long time and then they so well, I'm going to go and have that bit of cake or whatever else it is. They know they don't feel right afterwards. It makes them very much more acutely aware of how their body's actually actually working. Um, so it, the the um, the acronym you have is SANE, S A N E, which kind of stands for the, the whole principle. So just explain quickly what that is. I've repeatedly said you have to increase the quality of foods you eat. And when I say that, people probably think, well, that means I need to shop at a more expensive grocery store, right? That's what you mean by high quality. It's not. What I mean by high quality, it doesn't mean high cost. High quality means that a food is very satiating or it has high satiety. It fills you up and it keeps you full for a long time. That's the S insane. High quality food is an unaggressive food, meaning it doesn't cause tremendous swings in your hormones. A high quality food is nutrient dense. That's the N insane. And it's also inefficiently stored as body fat. So we want to eat satisfying, unaggressive, nutritious, and inefficient foods. That is the acronym SANE. And to the extent that you can eat SANE foods, and those are non-starchy vegetables, nutrient dense protein, whole food fats, and low fructose fruits, you will lower your set point. And to the extent that you eat insane foods, processed fats, processed starches, processed sweets, you will elevate your set point weight. And there's a very handy um, food list in the book that basically gives you all the foods that you can eat that are compliant to that and um, it's pretty extensive to be fair um, the other thing I liked about it I, no actually I'm going to ask a different question first what I really enjoyed was reading the bit about why olive oil is not sane yeah this, is, this has got me in some trouble so yeah, I'll uh, bet so yeah, go so, for it so here's 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 the thing about olive oil uh, when we look at satiety aggression nutrition and efficiency that's you don't go to the grocery store and look for the satiety section of the grocery store it doesn't exist but, so we have but, to try to John, simplify wouldn't it be great if you could get a sticker on every one of them that complies <laughs> to that and it says Jonathan Baylor saying and then you <laughs> yes. pick those up right we, we are trying we're trying uh, yeah, <laughs> cool. the um so there are three common denominators for saying foods. They're high in water, fiber, and protein. Because foods like high in water, fiber, and protein are more satiating, unaggressive, nutritious, and they're less efficient. Now, if you think of something like olive oil, olive oil is a whole olive with all the water, fiber, and protein taken out. Coconut oil is a fine oil if you need to use oil. But you know what's way better for you? Whole coconut. Because everything that's good about olive oil is in olives plus more. Everything that's good about coconut oil is in coconut plus there's a whole bunch of other healthful stuff in the whole food. So one of the things that it seems like everyone in the world agrees with, with the exception of food manufacturers, is that eating whole foods is a good idea. Oil is not a whole food. Oil is to, like olive oil is to olives, what processed sugar is to a sugar beet. And, and people don't get day. that. It's a processed food at the end of the day, right? It absolutely is a processed food. And it's a processed food that, like, to be clear, eating vegetables that have been prepared in a healthy oil is fine. But you don't need to put five tablespoons of oil in there. You could probably have a teaspoon of oil and it would still be delicious. And also people forget the calorie content when they when you see these chefs on TV where they pour the bottle and they you know, with just a few glugs of that. And that's like two, three hundred calories, and and all of a sudden that's not in the pan when they serve the dish, so it's gone somewhere, and um, and it's very, very easy to start overeating on that kind of stuff, um, and you know there is a, a point at which your body will start having to store excess calories as fat, if if it's all the time. The um uh, the other thing about that I enjoyed about the book was obviously you've got meals in there and examples and so on and so forth. But one of the things it had, which you don't often find, you, well, I can't remember the last health book, diet book, whatever you want to call, you've got a list of 
herbs and spices that go with foods. So if you've got beef, for example, you'll have a list that goes with beef, one that goes with shellfish, one that goes with salmon. And, um, and that, I think, is one of the, the key differentiators because there's a, there's a statistic that says people that buy something, whether it be online or in a shop, or whatever it is, if it's a book or, or, or an educational thing, especially diet books, 4% of the people will actually pick up and read it. And of that, I think 1% will actually put it into practice for a period of time. But often it's the same stuff, right? It's like, here's a, here's a meal plan. Have this for breakfast, this for lunch, this for dinner. Have a chicken salad, have this, have water, da, da, da. get your sleep, thanks. That's all you need to do. And then they go and make that food and it's bland and pretty unappetizing. Herbs and spices have not only got great flavor to them, but you've got huge amounts of nutrient density in them that you don't get other places. And also a lot of antioxidants and you know things like cinnamon that are gonna regulate your blood sugar and all that kind of jazz, right? So when you know what to put it with, it makes it so much better. And the worst thing is you put the, the wrong spice or herb with the wrong food and then it's not, it's not a good look, right? But because it's in there, I was reading it, I was thinking, you know what, that's probably one of the cleverest things to do to make people stay with the program kind of thing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I found that uh, a lot of people are intimidated by cooking an entire I'm I'm the oldest millennial possible and a lot of people who are younger than I am just were never taught how to cook ever. They just never happened because it was all microwave, it was all processed yeah. foods. And we got to make cooking simpler. We got to make it easy. And look, there is nothing easier than putting some vegetables and putting some protein in a pan or in a baking dish sprinkling on some seasoning, wait for 10 minutes, and, you know, enjoy. And that's the, the model of cooking that we help to introduce in this book. Yeah, and um, it's also got some tips on uh, what to do if you're too busy to cook. And I read that, and I just thought, well, the first thing is you've got to not be too busy. Because that mm -hmm. means there's something else in your life that's not right. But um, if you are too busy, because you haven't quite got around to dealing with that work thing that you've got going on there's some tips in there on on how to be you know how to stick with this stuff because that's the first hurdle for many people they get home and go look i haven't got time to cook you know oh I've got, it's got to be something quick i can put in the microwave and blah 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 and i've bought all these processed foods or whatever. so it, it covers a lot of angles have you have you got time to go to exercise or not because i know you're pushed for time today well i can i can go pretty quick i think okay because there is a section on exercise and and the and the the clickbait of it is you only need to do twenty minutes a week. Yeah, and the, and the truth of that is, and I can still get to the truth of that within our time constraint, is that the point of exercise is not to burn calories. Period. Because we're not here to lose weight. We're here to lower our set point. So when you look at lowering your set point, you say, how does exercise relate to lowering my set point? Well, the way that exercise relates to lowering your set point is by changing your hormonal balance. And the way you exercise to change your hormonal balance is a form of exercise that is so effective that you can't do a lot of it. It's just impossible. And that form of exercise is not sprinting. And, and you have to buy the book to find out what it is. But <laughs> let me use just sprinting as an example. You can't try to sprint for an hour. It's impossible to sprint for an hour. You can't sprint for an hour. So there's an inverse relationship between the quality of exercise and the quantity of it that you can do. So what we introduce in the book is a super safe, easy to do, anyone can do it form of very high quality exercise that because it is so potent and it is so hormonally healing, you physically can't do a lot of it. So you do less and get more, which is awesome. Yeah, and, and it's all written in the book. It's uh, very clear. Um, it, it's definitely, definitely worth having a look at. Um, and, if you, and I'm sure if you hunt around, you'll find the, the same information on Jonathan's site and so on, and, and some of his videos got some great stuff up on uh, online. So definitely, definitely spend some time checking them out. Um, there's also what you know. Another thing that's often overlooked is there's a great part about mindset and how you should be approaching um, what you're doing. And and with clients that work with me, when you're doing six and twelve month um, bits of work with people. There's, you know, I bring in people who do the, the mindset for them so they've got the right approach to things because, you know, that's not my speciality. I, I'm 
you know, competent at it, but I want someone who's an expert at it. And they coach my clients in their mindset so that they get the most of the program because they're not cheap, you know, and they spend a lot of time with us, but we want them to get the most out of it. And you've got it in the book. Um, and again, that's a really important thing. So, um, mate, I, I mean, it's such a shame we've got so little time today, but I know you're mad busy and, uh, and it's getting late here. So um, any last points you want to make? The last thing I'd say, because it relates to everything in the book and everything on our website at sanesolution.com and relates to what you just said, is underlying all of this is the premise that quality is the key. And I need to take that one step further and say that like, I need you to understand that you are high quality. Like the human body is miraculous and high quality. And once you understand that you are of the highest quality and you're not fundamentally broken or stupid or lazy or flawed, but rather that you are high quality, you will know that because you are high quality, you deserve high quality, and then you will live in a high quality way as a result. And when you do that, it makes all the difference. Excellent. Okay, mate. So listen, um, best place to find you online for social media. I, I know you've got Twitter and, and whatnot. Just go to SaneSolution.com. Again, that's Sane, S-A-N-E, Solution.com. And if you want to learn more about me as an individual, you can go to Jonathan Baylor, B-A-I-L-O-R, JonathanBaylor.com. Brilliant. And uh, there's going to be links in the show notes to all of the social media, to where they can buy the book and the websites and all the rest of it. So they can just click on there and have a look. Mate, thank you so much for spending the time today. I um, appreciate it. And, um, and I look forward to seeing all the other stuff that you're going to be talking about in the next 10 years. Because, uh, <laughs> Thank you, it's Paul. A, it's a great journey. All right, mate. Take care. See you soon.